Morning, ladies and gents. We're just going to wait a minute or so for all the attendees to join and then, and then we'll kick off. So thank you for your patience and thank you for joining. All right, good morning, ladies and gents. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for making time on your Friday morning to listen to the new ETF that we're really excited about. Um, before I begin, um, just for your in, uh, interest and information, I do have uh, my colleague Michelle um, uh, on in the background. And if there are any technical challenges or any questions you have, um, please pop them into the um, Q&A and, and Michelle will deal with them. In terms of general questions that I'll be answering, I'm gonna answer them after the presentation. It tends to make for better flow and so forth. So please uh, feel free to add them into the Q&A um, panel and, and we will be dealing with all of them um, at, the end of the, at the end of the webinar. So thanks very much for joining. My name's Chris. Um, I head up product and client solutions at CoreShares um, and I'm really excited to be presenting to you this morning about our new Core Shares Total World Stock ETF uh, Feeder Fund. That's the long name, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but the share code is really simple, it's global. So, you know, it, it, it's um, <clears throat> an ETF we've been working on for, for, for quite some time now, and we're really excited to bring it to market. The webinar shouldn't be much longer than 20 minutes of presentation, and then, and then we'll go to Q&A. So I guess before we jump into the details and specifics about the ETF, we just want to take a step back and, and, and look at why go offshore, why, why actually invest offshore as a South African investor. And something we've been talking a lot about recently as a business, we've been talking about behavioral biases, investor biases, and so forth. And really the one bias that underpins the, ma the major rationale for going offshore is a bias known as the home bias. Now, home bias is something that's not specific to South Africa. Um, it, it's specific to any investor who, who can invest in their home markets. And what it, what, it, what it really means is that as investors, we tend to overinvest in our home market. And we tend to do this for a number of reasons, for some structural reasons and behavioral reasons. On the structural side, as a South African investor, our pension funds, as an example, are restricted in terms of how much money they can uh, take offshore. So a large portion of most investors' portfolios and savings <coughs> is um, their pension fund. And, and of course, we can't take more than 30% offshore. You may have a home or an apartment um, or, or some sort of property in the, in the South African market, which is often also a large proportion of your, of your holistic portfolio, um, your total portfolio. And that, of course, is a South African-based asset subject to South African risks, sovereign risks, uh, political risks, <laughs> currency risks and so forth. That sits in South Africa. And then often, um, you know, we have a, a business if we're an entrepreneur or if we are owner-managed business, even if we are being paid by a big South African corporate, very much linked to the South African economy about how South Africa um, is doing in terms of its economic health. So we tend to have, not as a function of intention, but as a function of a byproduct of structure, a large portion of our holistic portfolio is invested in the South African market. And for that reason, we tend to have this thing known as a home bias. Now, when you take a look at your portfolio, yes, you may be putting 5,000 Rand a month or even putting your entire bonus or, you know, if you've got a million Rand tucked away offshore, you think it's a lot of money. When you look at it in the context of your total portfolio, suddenly it doesn't look like such a lot of money suddenly it looks like you've got 60, 70, 80% of your portfolio invested in South Africa. Now, zoom back and look at the investment rationale for that. Well, it's a major divergence from what is the most efficient allocation, and that's a global um, allocation to capital markets, where South Africa represents less than half a percent of our portfolio. Another funny behavioral trait, and kind of as a side note, we like talking about behavioral trends and investor behavior and patterns, is something known as a familiarity bias. 
And what that really means is that as a South African investor, we're far more likely to say buy um, shares in SPA or, or ShopRite or Woolworths than we are to invest in shares of, uh, say, let's say Walmart in the US. Um, and the reason <laughs> why this is, is because we're familiar with these businesses. We, we feel because we shop you know, at the shops potentially and we can look and feel and touch the brand and we drive past their marketing that we know more about this business and we, then, then it must be a better opportunity than opportunities elsewhere globally. So this familiarity bias almost amplifies the structural disadvantage that we have as investors um, when we're looking at making allocations in our investment portfolios. So home bias is a, is a massive thing and it really shouldn't be underestimated. And the reason why we want to talk about it is we don't want to talk about investing outside of South Africa as something opportunistic. We don't want to talk about it as, you know, saying that, you know, the South African government is, is, is up to no good and, and, and politically there's a lot of risk in our market and so forth. We actually just want to, in the cold light of day, look at the structure of our portfolio, look at the unintended bets that we're taking. And guess what? For most investors, 99.9%, without even making a view on South Africa versus the rest of the world, you should be investing a lot of money offshore. So, so it's, it's, it's a really interesting bias. And, and I, I recently read an article that it, it actually even goes further. This was a research done in the US where investors in the US not only have home bias towards the USA, they actually have home bias towards their states. So companies that have greater presence in their states, um, you know, they tend to own more of those companies. So it really is a massive, a massive bias in investors. So, you know, that's kind of the footprint. That's the leapfrog. Why, why invest offshore? Um, and it talks about concentration risk. The other concentration risk that we have when we, um, or unintended concentration risk that we have when we have this massive home bias is one of currency. So, so it doesn't only relate to shares and, and assets, but it also relates to currency. All of our South African-based current uh, assets are priced in rands, are subject to the fluctuations of the rand. And by investing offshore, we get to diversify away from that currency. And we get to diversify in the global portfolio uh, into a basket of currencies, both hard currencies, you know, the dollar, um, a lot of the developed markets currencies recognized as hard currencies and some of the emerging currencies, Chinese renminbi and, and, and so forth. So, so really the opportunity to invest offshore um, is not one that is often kind of um, uh, positioned in, the, in, in mass media where, where you know, it's, it's all got to do with a negative outlook on South Africa. Actually, it's just an investment case. It's a really simple investment case. Um, and we just want to make people aware of, of this home bias. Um, so, so, you know, that's our stance in terms of investing offshore. Um, and, and, and what you do see over long periods of time is, 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 is currency depreciation. Mind you, the currency is, is really strong at the moment. We've, over the last five years, South Africa so has the strongest emerging markets uh, currency, um, almost flatlined uh, relative to the dollar over five years. So, you know, we, we tend to also only notice the negatives when it comes to our market. We tend to be over pessimistic um, when it comes to South African markets. So we, we, we're not taking that view. We're taking a view that actually structurally, let's just get money offshore, let's invest offshore. So that's kind of the starting point, the point of um, departure, if you will. The next question is, okay, I'm investing offshore. Why should I invest in passives? Why should I be looking at a core shares ETF or, 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 or a passive fund? You know, why, why shouldn't I be selecting an, an active manager or stock picking? Um, and the real reason is, you know, the, the, just the probability of outperforming these indices <coughs> is, is very low. And, and this is something that is relatively consistent, perhaps not at the 93% of underperformance, but, you know, certainly the top, very difficult to have a consistent fund that performs in the top quartile, you know, over multiple uh, time periods, over, you know, rolling five-year or 10-year windows. So really the, the motivation for investing in, in a global equity fund, uh, global equity ETF, um, uh, does relate to, to, you know, not only the potential, um, when, when you look at active, at least, you shouldn't only look at the potential for outperformance, but look at the high probability of underperformance. Um, and and, and that, that, that becomes a massive challenge. So we believe when investors, South African investors are looking offshore, they should not only be looking you know, to externalize money, but looking for a really low cost, efficient core exposure in a passive fund that reduces manager risk, 
that, that, that reduces exposure to the potential for underperformance. So with that, I'm going to chat a bit out about our ETF. As I mentioned, I don't want to you know, go into too much detail. The reality is, is, is that it's a really simple product, but it's within the simplicity that the, you know, the real investor um, opportunity lies. And so, so let's talk a little bit about our ETF. So the core shares, um, total, <coughs> total World ETF, please excuse my, my dry cough, um, is an ETF that tracks the FTSE Global All Cap Index. It is a unique index in so far as certainly in the South African market, it's the first of its kind to be tracked. It not only invests in developed markets like the US, you know, the UK, Europe, et cetera, it also develops and emerging, uh, invests in the emerging markets. And this, in, this includes you know, China, India, Russia, Brazil, um, et cetera. So a large emerging markets component. And, and also, in addition to that, it doesn't only invest in large cap shares, which is what, what, what typically we see in our market, but it also invests in mid and small cap shares. So really it represents the entire opportunity set um, of, of investments when you are investing globally. And, 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 and we want to talk about some of the differences, some of the key value propositions that it brings to the market and, and, and relative to some of the existing products in the market um, in the South African market at the moment. And, and that's, that's what I'm going to jump into. So the question is, why, why is this kind of uh, important? Why is this merging markets component important? Well, it gives you exposure to what we call the real economy. When I talk about the real economy, I'm talking about the economy as represented by GDP, so as essentially represented by company revenue. That's a, a one way you could look at a GDP measure is to say, well, if countries were companies, what's their revenue? Um, so so what, what, when we look at countries weighted by GDP, we suddenly see that emerging markets actually make up around 35% of total global GDP. Um, but if you look at most global exposures that we that we can buy on our local market and that we can invest in in our local collective investment schemes unit trust market, they tend to focus only on the developed market. So, so, so that, that exposure, which represents a large portion of the real economy is for all intents and purpose ignored. Um, and what this, what this fund aims to do is to give you exposure through stock markets, through the capital markets um, into these emerging markets. Now, certainly there's a disconnect what you'll see is that the weighting in emerging markets in this ETF is around 11%. So yes, there's still some way to go to catch up with the, the as I said, the real economy, um, but nonetheless, there's exposure. If you look at the majority of world funds on the JSC, their weight is, is, is most likely, or, or in the South African market full stop, the weight is most likely 0% in the emerging markets um, or, or low single digits. Now, emerging markets and developed markets, it's a way of splitting up markets based on their structure, based on their um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, standing in the world economy. But there are some defini uh, definition discrepancies. So just to be clear, the way that we define um, emerging markets um, is, 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 again, in line with kind of World Bank definitions. But there is a few countries that are subject to kind of uh, some discretion. And the one is South Korea. South Korea is interesting because some people define it as an emerging market. Some people define it as a, as a, as a, as a developed market. Um, in the instance of, 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 of our portfolio, we actually define it as a developed market in line with FTSE. FTSE is our index partner in this instance. So, 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 so we, we define it like that. If you say, for example, go to MSCI, who runs a whole lot of indices, um, they, they actually define South Korea as, emerging, as an emerging economy. So, so if you were to define this basket of portfolios, in line with MSCR, which is commonly cited, it would actually pick up to about 13, 14% in emerging markets. So the gap can close depending on how you kind of, uh, how you define the different markets. But really the, the idea here is that you get a foot into the door of these high growth economies, economies with significantly more attractive uh, um, uh, kind of um, statistics at a demographic level, younger populations, growing populations, consuming populations, as opposed to a lot of the European developed market uh, populations, which demographically are very weak from an economic exposure perspective. So that's the one thing. Now to drill down into the underlying uh, countries, when we look at emerging markets and developed markets, you can see that there's just a massive exposure. I mean, 
you, you quite literally are getting exposure to every country globally that has a capital market with the exception of the frontier markets. Now the frontier markets are problematic from an investment standpoint because they tend to be hard to get your money in and out of. So there's a lot of uh, risk in the capital market and it's one of the reasons why they're defined as a frontier market. And, and, and they're, they're the kind of markets which, which are, are, are kind of a little bit on the, on, on the left field and super illiquid, some strange regimes, political and, 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 and structural at a capital market perspective. So we don't, we don't invest in those. Those are kind of, those are markets like Nigeria. You know, those, those, those are kind of uh, the, 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 the Nigerias, the uh, Venezuelas, you know, these are frontier markets. So super high risk from a, from a political and, and geopolitical st standpoint. But you can see extremely, extremely <coughs> broad exposure across developed and emerging markets. Some 49 odd countries represented. How does this weighting split? Well, it's market cap weighted. So that means the bigger the, the bigger the country from a capital market perspective, the bigger its exposure is in this portfolio. USA still dominates <coughs> at 57 odd percent. And then you then you kind of very, you know, with a very big gap, start moving down the, the, the chain. One interesting thing to note is China is 5%, but when you combine Taiwan, which which is a juristic uh, uh, district, if you will, of, of China and Hong Kong, China jumps up to, to north of 8%, closer to 9%. So actually China exposure in this portfolio is your, is your second largest, depending on how, again, you define China, ask the Chinese, they'll tell you that Taiwan and Hong Kong are part of China uh, and, and inverse that and, and, and people won't. So we've actually split it out into their legal jurisdictions uh, to give you an idea. But, but if you're looking at emerging markets, actually, the emerging market that kind of dominates, if you if you say if you could call it the USA of developed markets, it would be would be China, and then you kind of move down the the, the rung. One kind of interesting side note, I mean, a lot of people say, well, I can pick countries. USA has been so good in the last ten years, and and you know I'm going to stick to stick to the USA um, because you know I'm just I'm just going to hold the USA basket because because why invest elsewhere? You know, Europe has lagged, the UK has lagged, um, Japan has lagged over thirty years. <laughs> very diff difficult. I want to roll back 30 years and, and tell you who was the largest shares in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world allocation. And it was actually Japan and the USA. Japan and the USA both sitting with around 35% each in a global portfolio. So, you know, had you made your bet in that instance on Japan, which would have been quite a reasonable bet at the time, they were the manufacturing powerhouse of the world. You know, they had a lot of strong uh, uh, metrics in their favor. You know, you, you you really would have taken the pain over the last 30 years and what has lagged global equity performance in total. So from going to 35% to 7% and the US going from say 35 to 57, you know, is, is a massive divergence in, in, in outcomes. So although yes, it seems like the US has always dominated and will always dominate, just roll the picture back a little bit and, and see, see, see what's happening, look at demographics and may, maybe, you know, we shouldn't have all our, our baskets in, in, in one country or one geography. Certainly from an investment standpoint, there's no evidence to suggest that one country has a structural advantage over another and, and therefore you should put all your investments into one particular country. Again, although US looks large, this is in, in, in this existing, in this portfolio, if we look at say a world, an MSCI world type approach, which is what the most of the market tends to follow, US is more like 67%. So even, even more exaggerated. Where does that weight come out of? Well, because we invest in more countries and we invest in emerging markets, we actually distribute that weight down the tail and down into some of those emerging markets and, and upweight some of the, the, the smaller countries. <clears throat> At a sector weighting, um, no surprise technology dominates this portfolio. Kind of in line and almost as a byproduct of US dominance in capital markets at the moment. Um, but really a, a nice representation of, of global sector allocations. Again, contrast this as a South African investor, where you would see basic materials, which is only 4% of this portfolio, sitting up at closer to 40% in, in, in our market portfolio. So you get an idea that, sure, this is actually a nice diversifier for South African investors, nice way to address home bias, nice way to get an option into some of these sectors that are underrepresented in in our market, but, but nothing really else to talk to. This actually looks quite similar if you look at a world basket versus a, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a, a total world basket like what we are bringing to the market. 
the kind of last key selling point. So we've looked at, you know, or, or I suppose one thing that's interesting to look at here, if I can scroll back to give you an idea of how diversified this portfolio is. Technology sector, which makes up 21% of the portfolio, has 1,022 shares representing that exposure. So, you know, really high um, share counts and, and really high effective share exposure. So what that does for investors is it drops down your <coughs> concentration in some of the mega caps. So if you look at a, a top 10 in this portfolio, it makes up around 12% of your total portfolio. If you look at an MSCI world approach, it's more like 17 to 18%. So what that means is you're dropping down that single stock risk at, at, a, at a total portfolio and, and, and that, that is attractive. But I mean, extremely diversified. The example I used yesterday when, when chatting to a client is, let's say you put 100,000 Rand in this portfolio. You've got 21% uh, in the tech sector. So you've got 21,000 Rand uh, in, in, in tech shares. Um, that 21,000 Rand represents 1,000 holdings of, of underlying shares. So you know, to try and replicate this in your individual capacity is, is very simply not possible um, uh, in, in, this, in this instance. And the other thing that, that I'm really excited about and I think really differentiates this product even further um, is the exposure to not just large and potentially large and mid-cap, but large, mid and small cap uh, shares on, on the market. So what it does is it takes your total market coverage from about 88% as a representation of, of capital markets when you're just buying large and mid-cap to more like 98%. So, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that even though the small caps, you know, is a extremely long tail, it makes up quite a significant portion of your portfolio, around 10% of your, of your total portfolio. So it's not an insignificant holding at all. It's not a, it's not an, a kind of a, an irrelevant tail um, of, of the portfolio. When I talk about tails, I'm talking about Know, how the top shares can dominate. And then you've got these long tails, 5,000 shares making up say 30% of your portfolio. But the small cap exposure is really exciting. Now, now there's a lot of evidence and there's a lot of research behind the small, the small cap factor, which, which essentially says that over long periods of time, small shares tend to outperform large shares. You know, it's a risk factor. So you're taking on slightly more risk, but in a scenario like this, where you're so diversified, you know, actually, this portfolio has lower levels of volatility uh, when, when compared to shares that just invest in large and mid cap exposure. So we can diversify away the idiosyncratic company specific risk in, in, in the small cap sector, get exposure to that trend of small, small companies outperforming large companies. And in the long term, we, we should get some enhancements out of that. And that's, that's really exciting for me. It's the first portfolio of this kind in South Africa um, to get exposure to that kind of market. And you can understand why most of the market doesn't have exposure to small caps, global small caps, is because you know it, it doesn't matter how much firepower you have as a local manager, you simply don't have enough analysts to cover 9,000 shares um, at, at, at any reasonable level. So you know this is an opportunity for investors to get that unusual um, exposure, which which really should reward them in the long term, contribute to both a risk level and 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 a return level contribution from a <coughs> improvement in risk adjusted return. This is the top 10 holdings and no surprise. I mean, these are all the big names that we know, most of them coming out of the US. Um, scroll down further and some Chinese companies and, and well, Taiwanese and so forth coming to the fore, but the, this should be as, as no surprise to, to us. So to recap, the, the new core shares uh, global ETF um, invests uh, or tracks a, a, a portfolio called the FTSE Global All Cap Index, covers around 9,000 shares um, you know, in, in every emerging and developed market in, in, in the world. Um, so it gives you exposure to the real economy as well as just the capital markets. Um, it gives you this, you know, super broad geographic exposure and it's a total market coverage strategy. So you're getting coverage of 98% of the markets. Um, you know, whereas if you just invest in large caps, it's more like 75, large and mid is more like 88, and then 98% of, of, of uh, shares that you you know your coverage so you know, extremely broad coverage and essentially you get more for less so um we're giving you all of this and it's coming in at what will be the lowest targeted t it's a targeted tr we can only publish tr after one year but we've got really um sophisticated ways of controlling for costs and controlling for trs in, in our market and we're targeting a tr of 29 basis points um so you know all in for 9,000 shares across you know a huge amount of markets emerging and developing really um, is a more for less kind of product. How do we do that? 
Well, we do it because it's structured as a feeder fund. The fund actually very simply just feeds into a Vanguard fund. Um, so our, our mandate is to track the index and our implementation method or our best way of tracking that index is actually to buy the Vanguard fund. So, so as part of that investment policy, we then go and buy the, the, the Vanguard fund. And that's how we achieve this super low TER. So that's kind of a high level investment case summary. As I mentioned, it's, it's actually a really simple product. We position it as this is like a global core allocation. You know, it's the kind of allocation that is timeless. You can invest in it, forget about it, super low cost and efficient. In fact, um, the TR of 29 basis points, if, if we look, or 0.29%, if we look at how, how else, how more efficiently could we get it outside of Vanguard, there quite simply isn't another more efficient way um, of, of achieving this exposure at that cost. Um, so, so really exciting stuff. Um, this is a kind of a commercial opportunity, like just a, looking at the market, like what is the, you know, opportunity as an investor? And you can just have a look, the number of shares covered, the number of countries covered, and then the percentage weight to the emerging markets. So more shares, more allocation to emerging markets, and, and it's coming in at the most cost efficient uh, TR in the market. If you compare to the only other competitor, there is only one other competitor that gives exposure to the emerging markets. And their exposure is around 5%. Again, the 5% means classifying South Korea as developed, like we do. So it's like for like. If we classify it as emerging, it would go out to seven, and then and then our weight would go out to 13. So it's kind of academic. Um, but you know, our, our fund is coming in at almost half the TR um, of, of, of that existing fund. With, with significantly more diversification in terms of the share count. So yeah, that's, a, that's, a, <coughs> that's kind of a wrap. Thank you for your time. Um, I now have kind of all the time in the world for you to take questions. This is a cheat sheet. The fund will be distributing, so it distributes income. Um, the, in, the, the index dividend yield is 1.76%. So you're taking off the TR, you're, uh, you, you're taking off some foreign withholding tax you're probably netting something like 1.1, 1.2% after all the taxes and so forth. I'm um, so low yield, but I mean, this, this is the market we live in at the moment, especially when it's dominated by global developed markets. Um, uh, yeah, so, so that kind of wraps it up. As I said, we position this as a really simple core allocation um, and, and really is a must have in, in most investors toolboxes. But again, both large and small, I mean, even super large institutional investors would be struggling to get their TER, not their management fee, their TER down to 29 basis points in a, in a strategy like this. So I'll shift over to um, Q&A. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and I will try and address all the questions now. How, the first question is a, is a pretty straightforward one. How often is the index rebalanced? The index is rebalanced quarterly. The turnover of the index on average is somewhere between five and 10% per year. So low turnover index, that's a kind of what we expect from market cap weighted indexes. This turnover, this um, kind of infrequent rebalance <clears throat> is what contributes to the efficiency of this fund, this kind of hyper efficiency that exists in this fund. Market cap um, uh, methodology bias would imply the need for a synchronized global recovery for the index to perform which occurs how often, question mark. Why are another methodology I equal weights or dynamic factor weights, et cetera? So, I mean, look, we could compare market cap weight to factor-based investing or equal weighting until the cows come home, and we could motivate good reasons for those. Um, uh, a synchronized global recovery for the index to perform, I think um, that that's true to a point. I mean, with the US being so dominant, I could argue that it doesn't necessarily need to be synchronized, but I kind of get your, your point, um, you know, what, why, why go for it? If we went into the equal weighting environment and you equal weighted 9,000 shares, um, you would find the portfolio cost, the turnover would move up significantly. So absolutely, you can get exposure to that kind of thing. Probably not on a 9,000 stock portfolio, but, um, you know, you're going to move the TR out to, uh, you know, 50, 60, 70 basis points. Um, so, yeah, I mean, costs are not everything. If you're looking for a diversifier, as I mentioned, I mean, that would probably be one of your big drivers of looking for dynamic factor weights or, or equal weighting. Um, you know, what you would, we would kind of encourage using that in your satellite portfolio. In fact, we run a, a global smart beater strategy, the global dividend aristocrat strategy, which complements the strategy really nicely, gives you allocation to other sectors, other drivers and 
in market returns. Um, uh, and, and, and so we, we're certainly not against it. We just saw the opportunity to bring in something that's more diversified, both at a stock level, at a, at a market level, and, and more cost efficient than anything else that exists. So this is not a me too product. This is, this is a new product. This is an exciting product in our market. Priced in Zar, I would prefer uh, uh, access and hard currency. I mean, look, if, if, that's, if that's what you would um, um, prefer, absolutely externalize your money. The world is your oyster, go and buy shares. This is specifically priced in Zar. There's a number of reasons why that can be efficient for investors. Firstly, from an investor constraint perspective, a number of structures simply can't invest offshore. So, so here you get the dynamic look through exposure. And to be clear, although it's priced in Zar, you get the, you get the appreciation of hard currency when it does appreciate relative to the, to the Zar. You also get the, the, the converse, the, the, the kind of um, <clears throat> uh, um, the depreciation, of course. So, I mean, we, we're not positioning this as a, um, you know, to compete in the global market. This is a JSE listed security with all the benefits that come with it. What a lot of investors don't look at when they're investing offshore is the cost of externalizing money. You know, most retail investors, in fact, we did an exercise for a big balance sheet the other day of 50 million Rand, where it was going to take them 10 years to claw back their currency costs, where, um, you know, to become competitive again with, with one of our ETFs that's JC listed, even though our ETFs management fee is more expensive. So, you know, just consider all the cost chains when you're going offshore. Um, but but we're, not, we're not saying don't go offshore, we're just saying this is available in, in the South African markets. Um, nice question here, what is the size allocation to small caps that come from emerging markets? Um, to be honest, off the top of my head, I don't have that exact allocation. If I was to proportionately allocate the emerging market weight um, uh, into um, you know, what, what the allocation of small caps, you would say only around 11, 12% of the 10% is coming from emerging markets. So like 1.3%, between one and 1.3% of the portfolio is EM small cap, the balance of the 10% coming from DM small cap. I don't have that number on hand. I'll, I'll crunch the numbers and, and have a look. <laughs> um, so the next question is, VT is priced at nine basis points. Why is your so much more at 29 basis points? And um, what are you doing to warrant the costs? Well, the structure is what warrants the costs. So we're making it available in RAND trading on the JSC. We have another fund structure with all the bells and whistles that come with that, the custody, the trustees, the audits, et cetera. I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the cost of FX, um, um, you know, and, and, and that. So what makes up the cost essentially is Vanguard fund, our management fee, plus VAT, um, plus audit fees, plus custody fees, plus trustee fees, plus bank charges. Um, that's how you're going to get to a TR of 29 basis points. Um, I, I, think, I think it's fair to say, you know, Vanguard is far more efficiently priced, but as I mentioned, actually on a global scale, this, isn't, this is one of the cheapest global exposures in the world. Um, I, I certainly haven't seen, and I spend a lot of time looking at ETFs, anything with such broad coverage um, that's, that is this cheap outside of the Vanguard fund. So yes, it's more expensive than Vanguard, but globally, this is a, just about the second most cost efficient access to, 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 this, to this index, which is really exciting. Um, you currently have S&P 500 and Total World. Do you see the two working together within a portfolio or is it either or? Um, so <clears throat> if you held them alongside each other, what you need to consider is that there's gonna be a lot of overlap. Now, where, where you could use them next to each other from a, from a purist perspective is you would have, typically hold a fund like this, the one I'm talking about, the Total World Stock ETF, um, you would typically hold that as your core allocation. So like a large percentage of your global portfolio. If you as an investor then were taking a particularly bullish view on the US markets, you could upweight them by including like an S&P 500 alongside it. But consider it is already a large weight in this portfolio. So, you know, you would really have to have high conviction around the US markets. Um, to include S&P 500 alongside this. And to be frank, in the last 10 years, if you had done that, you would have been correct and you would have actually outperformed um, your peers who were just investing in a global portfolio. So yes, you can. There's going to be a lot of share overlap. Um, and, there's, and obviously, you need to double count for the US exposure. But, but I mean, it's absolutely, I mean, it really, um, this comes down to very specific investor needs, very specific um, uh, investor 
uh, kind of uh, objectives. The next question is how are the distributions dealt with? Well, the distributions are really simply distributed out to your stockbrokers. Um, you then would decide how you would um, uh, reinvest those dividends if it was back into this fund or into other opportunities. Um, the question says, does the investor need to reinvest? Um, and would you incur brokerage? Yes, you would. Um, and, and yes, you would need to reinvest. The, the, remember, ETFs are collective investment schemes. Um, and collective investment schemes like unit trust, um, the, the difference between an ETF and a unit trust is that the units trade on the JSC, and, and that's really as far as it goes. The rules around collective investment schemes in the South African context is that a conduit principle must apply. And for that conduit principle to apply, you need to distribute once a year at least as a unit trust. So the total return ETFs that you are seeing um, that are in the market are only total return and unit trust for that matter, because the underlying that they invest in doesn't distribute. If the underlying that you invest in distributes, then by, by regulatory requirements, you need to distribute. So yes, we do distribute them. It's based on getting this high pre-efficient exposure to Vanguard, um, which distributes um, and will distribute twice a year. Um, <clears throat> is the withholding tax in the US, um, because Vanguard's is in the US, higher than that of Ireland? Um, and yes, it is. So when you invest in, in the US directly, the withholding tax is 30%. When you invest via Ireland, it's 15%. Remember that allocation is only for US stocks. So it's only the US components on the, of the portfolio, um, not, the, um, not, not the rest of the world. Um, as, a, as, a, as a two tax jurisdictions, the US and South Africa does have a, a dividend, uh, a, a DTA, a dual taxation agreement. Um, and, and that does take into account the, the fact that you've already been taxed in the US. So this structure is tax neutral. I would argue that an Irish tax would, uh, structure would be tax advantageous. The catch is if you invest via Ireland, the costs of those funds just become so much more. Um, so what we saw was that the benefit of investing directly in the US and buying VT was more efficient than going and buying exposure through Ireland. So on a net basis, there's a bigger tax, the, the, the tax advantage that we may have got going through Ireland was less than the cost advantage that we got um, going through through, through the US. So it's really simply a, a cold numbers, look at the costs and the taxes and, and where are we most efficiently um, exposing our investors. And, and, and in this instance, um, it's, it's in the US. That's a great question, quite a technical one, but, but thank you. Um, <clears throat> that, that looks like all the questions. I, I'll see, give you guys an opportunity um, to, 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 to ask any more questions. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we're really excited about this um, and, and we're really excited about bringing this, this product to market. Um, I, um, we, we, you know, we've got all the information. Apologies, I just want to bring my screen up again. The, we're opening a book build process at the moment. What that means is that you can invest in the IPO. Now, an ETF is not like a share where you potentially get a discount to net asset value in, the, in an IPO. ETF is different where you still get the NAV, the advantage for investors is actually rather that um, you don't have to pay brokerage um, and you don't pay spread. So you get a, a more efficient um, exposure or more efficient access. And that's really the big advantage in uh, participating through the IPO. So, you know, if, let's say your brokerage is 50 basis points with a minimum of 150 rand, or let's say it's even 25 basis points with no minimums, which is cheapest in our market, um, then, then it's, you're still better off investing in the IPO than you would uh, in the market. So we'd encourage all investors to, to have a look at the IPO. Um, the, the book build is open at the moment. <coughs> all stockbrokers are welcome to participate. We've reached out to all the major guys and all the, all the guys who, we usually who usually participate and, and have in the past with us. If your stockbroker says CoreShares hasn't reached out to them, Please just drop us a line. We'll reach out to them. We're happy to engage with literally every man uh, and his dog um, to make sure that anyone can get access to, the, um, to, to this fund. So thank you very much. Um, let me just see if there are any more questions. I've got a, a, a question here. Um, Gix versus ICB. 
Um, it, this is a technical classification system. Is this something to consider or is it negligible? Uh, I think it's, it's pretty negligible. Um, I think the reality is that all of these different classification systems, um, you know, kind of net you into the same portfolio as an investor. So, so you know, what we're happy to do is pass over the holdings and you can classify it as you see fit. For example, FTSE uses the, the um, ICB standard, S&P uses X. Um, you know, you, you kind of got six of one and half a dozen of another when you net neutralize it, if you follow me. It's almost like when I was talking about emerging markets and developed markets. Um, and the reality is that, you know, whether you classify South Korea as emerging or developed, as long as you're doing a like-for-like -like comparison when you're looking at two funds, you come out at the same point. So, yeah, it, it, it is something to consider, but it, I would say it's very negligible. Um, thanks for that question. Another question coming through is, will this avail be available after 17th of May on our transact and, and Insignia? Absolutely. Again, if it's not available, give us a shout. We'll make sure it becomes available. Um, all of these platforms house our ETFs in some shape or form. I um, mean, because it's a listed security, they absolutely should be providing availability to investors. And we've reached out um, uh, to most investors to make sure that they can, uh, or to most brokers and platforms to make sure that they are up and running on, on listing date, which is the 17th. I'll have a look if there are any more questions. Thanks for all the questions. Really great to engage with you guys and, and, talk, about, and, and talk about this new fund. As I mentioned, you know, we're really excited about it. This is not rocket science, guys. This is super low cost, efficient exposure to global markets. It's, 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 it's kind of a first of its kind in our market. So you know, we like bringing things that are a little bit different that add some value to investors outside of just costs. But, but guess what? You know, when you compare this to other global exposures in South Africa, it's a cost leader as well. So you know, we're really excited about that. Thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll end the presentation there. It looks like questions have dried up. If you've got any further questions, please feel free to, to drop me a line um, and, and I will be more than happy to, to respond or drop a line to info at CoreShares. Um, the share code is global um, and, 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 and please reach out to your stockbrokers if you're looking for IPO access. We are more than happy to, to provide.